You're listening to The Law Lives Project. I'm your host, Angie Vishianan. I'm a lawyer that launched a startup focused on changing the legal profession through mentorship. Through this podcast, we will explore the early career steps of real lawyers to help students see that many of us didn't have it all figured out at first. It takes time to find your way in the profession, so we want to shed light on some of the challenges people face in the earliest part of building their careers. Each week, I sit down with members of the legal profession and chat with them about the paths they took to get where they are now, including the times they stumbled, the times they fell, and the times they needed a little help. To encourage candor and vulnerability on this show, the attorney guests will remain nameless, but their stories will be laid bare for your consideration. This episode is sponsored by Velocity LSAT. Have you ever noticed that people who succeed at the LSAT become taller, better looking, and more fun at parties? That they have the uncanny ability to juggle and are graceful ballroom dancers? Well, if you want to succeed at the LSAT, Velocity LSAT has got you covered. Velocity is the online video course taught by me, Dave Hall, the guy with all the 180s. At Velocity, we guarantee you'll hit the 99th percentile or improve by at least 10 points, or we'll keep working with you until you do. Law Lives listeners can get half off your first month's installment or $100 off of a year's subscription. Just enter code LAWLIVES, L-A-W-L-I-V-E-S, all one word, at checkout. Enroll, get more details, and get our contact info at VelocityLSAT.com. Today I'll be chatting with a state civil court trial judge. We'll be discussing his career path from law school to working as a litigator before being elected to his current position. We'll also touch on some of the roles and responsibilities of a civil trial court judge. Let's get started. Can you tell me what were the reasons you chose to go to law school? I've wanted to be a lawyer since I was in third grade. The only other thing I ever wanted to do was to play professional baseball. When I was barely coming into awareness of what was going on in the world, I understood that lawyers were at the vanguard, the civil rights movement, making trying to make this country live up to its uh, its promise. I tell young people who are thinking about law school that lawyers help people. That's what they do for a living. I think that it's a calling more than even a profession, certainly more than a job, to be of service to other folks. So that's why. Thank you. You're welcome. How did you pick which law school you wanted to attend? I got into Harvard Law School. <laughs> That seemed to make it pretty easy. What were a few things that you wish that you knew before attending law school? I don't know that there's anything that I wish I knew that would have made law school easier for me. And I think that's the thrust of your question. Um, Law school is a grind. Law school is a part of the rite of passage. If you want to be a lawyer, it is something that you just have to do. Uh, There are some schools that do a better job of teaching it. There are some schools that make it uh, easier for folks to go through, but it is just one of those rites of passage. Uh, So I don't think that knowing more about my professors would have made a difference. I think one would have more options getting to know some professors better. And so if I were counseling a young person thinking about law school, I would probably suggest Find some professors who have interests that you think align with yours or have had a life experience that you think is where you want to go. For example, if you think that uh, when you start law school, you want to be in government service, seek out a professor who's had experience in government service. That can help you negotiate along once you get through with law school. Did you have any particular practice area in mind? Oh, God, no. No, 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 of course not. Uh, Of course not. Very few people do. I ended up spending much of my practice representing school districts, which is a fairly narrow niche. There was no course in school law when I was in law school. Um, In fact, it probably is. I'm sure there was not at my alma mater today. But they say people plan and God laughs. I I, I had ideas of what I was going to do when I started law school and where I was going to be afterwards. Uh, None of that was the path that I ended up finding. And I'm pretty glad it's worked out the way it has. 
And do you feel like you made the right choice for law school or would you have picked a different school? I guess if I never wanted to graduate, I should have chosen the University of Hawaii. <laughs> but uh, other than that, no, I, I've got I've got no complaints about where I went to law school. Did you participate in any extracurricular activities like moot court or law review or clinics while you were in law school that you felt were particularly valuable for your career? Yeah, I did a, what was then a very controversial pilot program called Introduction to Advocacy my third year, which really wasn't extracurricular because you got 10 credit hours of the 13 that you needed for a semester for this one course. It let people, it let young lawyers be supervised third year law students. It was taught by lawyers and judges. And actually, I've been on the guest faculty for that program for almost 20 years. Um, and they would actually go to court and try cases. So the day that I graduated law school, I had about eight or nine trials, at real trial, having been completed by me as first chair. It was the best thing that I did in law school. That's amazing. Did you do any ex other extracurricular activities that you really enjoyed or thought would also be beneficial for students? I played sports. <laughs> I'm not sure how beneficial that was. Uh, Probably to keep school, your sanity. Well, <laughs> you know, the law school back then was designed to occupy all of your waking hours. Mm -hmm. So there, there were a few things that we were committed to do that were ancillary or maybe tertiary mm -hmm. to actually studying and doing what you do in law school. What jobs, internships, or activities did you do in the summer between your 1L and 2L years? After my first year, I was in the Office of General Counsel at the Central Intelligence Agency. After my second year of law school, I did the traditional clerkships, one at a firm in Houston, one at a firm in Boston. Did you get to be in more than one practice area? or? No, no. I knew I, knew I wanted to do litigation, okay. so for me, there was no need to try tax or corporate or any other area of law. And how did you apply for those clerkships? Was it through on-campus interviewing or on your own? I did uh, what you all now call OCA, on-campus interviewing, which is just the, the routine for every law student. Do you remember what the interview process was like? It was very routine. You, you selected firms for whatever reason you did when the when a law firm appeared on campus, when they announced they were coming on campus, there was, there was a finite window of maybe three or four days, might have been a week, and they would say, we are interviewing on this day, and every student had the right to sign up for an assigned allotted time slot. And you just went, you interviewed. If they liked you, they invited you to come to the firm. You Did spent. you have any callbacks? Yeah, I not yet. <laughs> How did you apply for your post-law school position, your first post? Um, I, one of the firms after second year, I came to Cambridge was Dallas firm. I was contemplating coming back to Texas among two or three other options, and I interviewed with them. So the firm had a lot of people in it who were very politically active, and there was a lot of buzz in the firm talking about different races. So I'd be interviewing with one fellow and we'd be talking about the uh, Senate race in Massachusetts. We'd be talking about talk with another fellow, but an interest in the Senate race in New York. Uh, and, and the firm had a lot of political dynamism about it. So we, we, we found a nice little uh, commonality. And did you find that position through your law school, or did you find your in that position through just a job post? No, they, they announced that they were like about 600 firms. Okay. Maybe not quite 600, maybe about 400 firms came to the law school okay. each year. I decided I will sign up for one of your interviews. And can you generally describe the practice area that you chose? General litigation is where I went. Uh, the firm had a, did, did, was known for doing a lot of litigation. And so that's what I did. And what does litigation involve? It depends on the type of cases that you have and depends on the clients. Back then, it involved a lot more time going down to the courthouse. Lawyers weren't paid $250,000 a year back then. And so it was 
easier for cases that did not have as much money at stake to get to go to trial. And so we spent, we spent a good bit of time at the courthouse. Can you describe some of the tasks that you had to do, writing, researching? There's all, for every first-year lawyer in big law, there's a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Writing memos, which are more teaching the, law, the young lawyer about a substantive area of the law than really benefiting a client or a, or a, or a more seasoned partner. Drafting discovery, responding to discovery, interviewing witnesses, interviewing parties, preparing parties for depositions, attending depositions, and typical pretrial matters, special exceptions, motions to compel, pleas to the jurisdiction, all of those things require filing something and coming to the court and doing some some sort of oral advocacy. And how long did you stay in that first position? Five, six years. Do you think that you chose the right practice area? Did you enjoy it? Absolutely. And without revealing your exact employer, can you say what is your current position and what type of organization that you work for? My employer is the state of Texas. And what type of position do you have? I am a state district judge. How did you decide you wanted to be a judge? Well, I got tired of trying to persuade people and thought that I could make decisions as good as many of the judges that I was appearing in front of. And can you describe the application process or the process by which you became It's terrible. It's terrible. Uh, in Texas, we run for election. Uh, you run in a primary, and then you run in a general election. So it is, it's just running for office. And what types of activities do you have to do in order to run for office? Well, you should be, you should be involved in community activities so that people know you when you are thinking about running for judge. Uh, You have to do fundraising, which is part of politics on every level, but is certainly the most distasteful thing. Can you describe a few discrete tasks that you have to perform in your job? What types of tasks make up your day-to-day responsibilities? I have hearings set uh, all but Tuesdays. Which so that entails reading pleadings and reading responses, ascending the bench, listening to the lawyers argue, and making rulings based on what the what the pleadings and the evidence presents. What types of cases do you hear? Only civil cases. And can you describe some of the types of civil cases? Sure. We do all manner of breach of contract. So from somebody suing someone over a contract to build a house that somehow goes awry. Contracts between individuals and entities, uh, some as mundane as borrowing $10,000 from a bank and not paying it back, or financing a car and not paying for it, uh, to very complex. We had a case last year involving the payment for helicopters that had been financed by a bank. And then when one of the helicopters crashed, there were questions of airworthiness, which led to questions of do we continue to pay for these. Uh, breach of contract. We also do, do uh, torts, uh, professional torts, such as medical malpractice or legal malpractice or accounting malpractice, uh, corporate disputes, breach of fiduciary duties, and standard torts. Someone who is hit by a bus, someone who's in an automobile accident. So you have to learn about all these areas of the world. Yes, we do. So many. And how much of your time would you say you spend interacting with lawyers as opposed to preparing for your hearings? Uh, Maybe three quarters of the time interacting with lawyers. And how much time would you say during a week you spend working? A thousand hours. A week? There's nothing many hours in a week. <laughs> all of them. How about that? <laughs> we are very all the judges in the state district court are incredibly hard working. We take no time off. All we do is work. It's like a salt marsh. <laughs> what are the five best things that you like about your job? I get to help people. <laughs> that by far is the best thing. And that just manifests itself in different ways. Someone who is about to have their home foreclosed on, for example. 
who has been trying to make payments and for whatever reason the financer is inhospitable to, to that and they get to stay in their home. Or someone who's injured in a car accident and has a lot of medical expenses and that gets itself resolved. Or someone who's accused of hurting someone else and it turns out that they did not and they're vindicated. Those are the things that we do on a regular basis. Sometimes it's a lot less, it's a lot more process driven. So for example, a, a solo practitioner has filed a lawsuit for a small firm and finds himself on the other side of a massive group of lawyers who tries to inundate them with things to do every day and just be overwhelming. We don't see it as much as we did years ago, but the uh, the Rambo style of litigation, scorched earth litigation, where the only thing that mattered was being able to beat the other side into submission, seeing something like that and being able to prevent that from happening. And what are the worst things about your job that you don't enjoy? Running for office. listening to The Law Lives Project with Angie Vishionen. This episode is sponsored by Crescendo. Crescendo helps law students crush finals, the MPRE, and the bar. With hundreds of mnemonics and illustrations, thousands of official NCBE practice questions, affordable pricing, lifetime access, whiteboard videos, plus audio outlines and audio flashcards, Crescendo is revolutionizing legal education. Unlike some competitors who require expensive deposits, Crescendo offers the opposite, a 30-day, no-questions-asked, money-back guarantee. Most everyone sticks around. The five-star reviews explain why you should try Crescendo. Matthew from Harvard said he wished he had Crescendo as a 1L. Kimberly from BYU said it's tricky business to concisely explain and teach such a vast amount of information, and Crescendo does so in an entertaining, easy-to-listen-to way. Ryan from ASU said he's convinced that Crescendo is the very best way to memorize black-letter law. Visit Crescendo.com to learn more. That's C-R-U-S-H-E-N-D-O dot com. Now, back to the episode. Are there certain things that you wish you knew about being on the bench before you became a judge? Well, uh, I teach at the College for New Judges, and one of the things that we tell folks, and we also do a program here for people who've been elected who aren't yet ready to take the oath, you, you can't get too full of yourself. You're never as smart as lawyers will tell you. You become smart once you become a judge. You're never as good looking. I must have lost 20 pounds the day I won the election because everybody I saw, you look so good. Have you lost some weight? Is your hair growing back? Oh my like, God, you look like you're 30 years younger now. You're smarter. Your, your jokes are funnier. Uh, everybody loves you when you become a judge, and you have to be careful not to buy into your own hype. What are things that you wish lawyers knew about being a judge? We aren't impressed by the things that they think are impressive. A, a response to a motion that is 500 pages is not as impressive as a response that is three pages that has one citation or one bit of evidence that's attached to it. We understand what we're looking for when we take the bench. And so when I ask a lawyer a question, and the lawyer starts going off on a tangent and starts talking about something else. I understand that that lawyer is intentionally not trying to answer my question, regardless of how long I let them prattle on in another direction. How is your performance evaluated in your current position? Every four years, the citizen decide I'm doing a good job, I should stay, or there's somebody who can do a better job. Do you have any supervisors in your current position? Well, the Court of Appeals, of course, supervises us. There are uh, 13 members on the Fifth Court of Appeals, and there are nine members on the Supreme Court. So I guess one could, could say that they, but they, their job is 
much less supervisory, but uh, they review the decisions that we make after the case is over. There is nobody that says, for example, you probably should be here at 6.30 in the morning rather than 7 in the morning. There's nobody that says you cannot take off your birthday. Uh, there's no one you need to ask for that. We are uh, we are fairly autonomous. Fairly, we are autonomous as a group of of judges. It's it's constitutionally based. Are there any promotions for your position? If I work really hard, do I get a promotion? No, no. Uh, I, I guess one could make a seek a political promotion and run for another court. There is a court of appeals or the Supreme Court if one were inclined, but there's nothing like a performance-based. Yeah, it's not like you start as an associate judge and do a good job for five years and become a county court law judge or a justice of the peace, and then ten years later ascend to uh, the district court. The, the process doesn't work quite that way. We're, we're all pretty autonomous and compartmentalized in, in a, a, a silo. There is this cloistered space, and that's where each of us does her or his calling. If you don't mind disclosing, what is the earning potential of someone in your the state? The state law mandates our salary, which is about $160,000 a year. What are some of the leading professional organizations or bar associations or um, activities that you currently participate in as well, a judge? Judges are restricted from doing a lot of the things that we get normal people do in the professional law. We all have to be members of the uh, State Bar of Texas. Some are members of the American Bar Association. There are affinity bars. Um, I'm active in the African American Lawyers Association called Jail Turner uh, Society. I was a founder of the uh, W.J. Durham Association, which is the African American judges in the state. If a law student wanted to follow in your footsteps and become a judge eventually, what advice would you have? How would they go? Work hard um, and develop a solid reputation as a lawyer, a reputation for honesty and veracity and excellence, not just competence. Also be active in one's community, however you choose to define that. I was active in municipal government, running some, involved in, and then running some local uh, governmental initiatives, and also being active in the political party of one's choice. It's a political decision here in Texas. Judges are elected as a part of the partisan electoral process, so we run as Democrats or as Republicans. And being active in the party makes it more likely than not that one will ultimately receive the, uh, the party's blessings via the primary. Can you describe how you go about getting the party support? Assuming you are active in all of those things, if there is a, in, in my case, uh, this bench became vacant because the judge who sat here decided to run for another office. I spoke to other elected officials uh, in the legislature and in Dallas County. I expressed an interest and was fortunate that many of those who have people who listen to them endorsed my candidacy for judge. Uh, I ran in a primary that started with four people. Um, a couple dropped by the wayside. Uh, I won the primary and then won the general election. What are some things that law students can do to meet or network with other people in your type of position? Show up at the courthouse. I talk to when, when, when the trial day or the hearings are over. Every now and again, I have law students who are interested in what we're doing, who just want to talk. For the most part, we're all pretty approachable. We are glad to talk with young law students who are interested in this career. Can you tell me what your ethnicity is? Yes, I can. I am African American. <laughs> Have you ever faced any particular challenges being African American? <laughs> who of us has not? Of course I have. I guess most relevant for you, I interviewed while I was in law school with a 
partner in a Dallas firm who told me he was not going to hire me uh, because I was African American. He just did not think that we would fare well in front of Dallas County juries. Um, when I first came to Dallas to practice in 1979, no firm had hired an African American associate. Do you think that the legal industry has improved as a whole factor? Well, uh, I used to say when I was in management in my law firm, and we would evaluate partners, some people would say, well, I'm doing better, I'm improving. There's a big difference between improving and doing well. Uh, so while, this is cert while the situation certainly has improved, it's still terrible. Uh, the, the number of the percentage of African-American partners is still in the low single digits at every uh, large firm of the American Law 100, American Law 500, still in low single digits. There's probably not a firm that's got more than two or three African-American partners. Uh, the Bar Association and most firms love to crow about their diversity, but when the rubber meets the road, partnership at law firms is still not quite as white as a Klan meeting, but certainly as white as any meeting of the Republican Party. <laughs> Do you have any particular advice for African American students? Well, anybody, anybody that's got to the point where they're listening to this podcast understands the zeitgeist uh, of uh, 21st century America. There's nothing that I can say that they don't already know. This is the, 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 the practice of law just by the numbers is not particularly hospitable to people of color. And why do you think that is? Racism. Racism is an institution that has pervaded this country since before the revolution of 1776. It's, it, Condoleezza Rice said it is the cancer in the American body. What do you think it will take to improve the percentage of African American partners in the firms? Well, to, to make it good or to make it improve? Oh. Those are two different questions. Oh. Well, it will, it will continue to improve each time another class of partners, that is, a year, uh, law school class, I guess now of maybe two, 2010, is up for partnership. The more partners there are, the more African-American partners there will be uh, to make it um, good. To make it good, it'll take our society getting better. I don't know what it's going to take to make that happen. And lastly, do you, can you describe between working at your first firm mm -hmm. and your role as a judge now, mm -hmm. how did your career path develop? I stayed at my first, first firm for a bunch of years. Uh, I left and formed a firm with a handful of other uh, expats, as we call ourselves, former members of that firm and one other fellow practiced law with in a small firm for five years, was appointed by Governor Richards, served a term as a, an unexpired term as a judge, went back to another large firm, stayed there for about 10 years, formed, spun off from that with eight lawyers, uh, did that for a couple of years, and then ran for judge, and here I am. everyone that's it for today thank you to our guest speaker and thank you to all of you for listening to another episode of the law lives project if you're a prospective law student that's interested in speaking with attorneys one-on-one -on -one, check out legoplegal.com legoplegal is an online mentoring platform that connects prospective law students with attorney mentors sign up for a membership today to learn more about the practice of law and see if it's a good fit for you if you enjoyed this episode, I would appreciate it if you left a review on iTunes or any other platform that you're listening on. If you have any questions or comments about anything you heard on the podcast, or if you have ideas for guest speakers, please contact me 
by emailing me and my team at info at leguplegal.com. Thanks again, and don't forget to tune in next week. Thank you.